At this point, I do not think there is a game this year or even last year that reaches the level of hype that I have for Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Everything that I have seen from this game has made me want it in my hands more. The story is intriguing, the characters look and sound fun, the combat is jam-packed with features new and old, the environments are predictably gorgeous, the soundtrack sounds amazing, I could go on. Xenoblade 3 seems to have embraced many of the great elements of the first two games and fixed some of the problem areas from previous games. The game has certainly sparked my fire already, as it has many others. So let's look in on what we know about the game so far. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is a JRPG developed by Monolith Soft and published by Nintendo. It is the fourth game in the Xenoblade series as part of the larger Xeno series, all of which has been under the direction of series producer slash director slash basically whatever he wants to be, Tetsuya Takahashi. Many other staff members have been confirmed to be returning for this game, which, considering how the game looks and sounds, is very unsurprising for me. The game was initially announced to be coming in September of 2022, but it was later surprisingly revealed that the game would be coming out earlier than anticipated. It is suspected that this was done to allow Splatoon 3 to move back in Nintendo's 2022 lineup. The Xenoblade 3 Direct also revealed, though, that there will be an expansion pass including costumes, heroes, quests, and story content. I am leery about this new trend of expansions, but there are far worse ways to monetize and keep a game going as we have seen all too much of in recent years. Years. The game is now coming out on July 29th for the Nintendo Switch, and based on the early previews out so far, it looks like Xenoblade 3 is going to be a special game. In the world of Ionius, the two nations of Kievs and Agnes are waging a perpetual battle, a war designed to feed the flame clock of their nation in a constant from birth until their final death. Each soldier is given 10 years of life to spend in service and battle, and if they survive to the end of those 10 years, they are honored in ceremony with their nation's queen. Those that don't make it, though, are played to the afterlife by the flutes of the Offseers. Our main characters are two Offseers, one from Kieves named Noah, and one from Agnes named Mio. Along with their companions, Lans, Uni, Tyon, and Senna, they change from fighting each other to fighting together against the brutal system they've been subjected to. They form a group called Ouroboros, no, not that Ouroboros, and seek out answers about the world to try to bring an end to this conflict. Their actions, though, do not go unnoticed, and both nations turn against the group, sending out soldiers and monstrous creatures to hunt them down. At least to me, this is a fascinating story and premise. The opportunity for drama, both interpersonal and worldwide, is immense, and I think I can already see some of the themes interwoven into this narrative. Fate is mentioned in trailers, and the idea of not knowing who moves us, both literally in the masked queens, and metaphorically with the red figures moving behind the scenes. It is still way too early to tell how the cast is going to play out, but even in the trailers we've gotten so far, I think I have a good grasp on their goals and values. I see a lot of potential for them as individuals and as a group, with Mio in particular standing out as a compelling protagonist alongside Noah. This game seems to be sticking to Xenoblade's writing strengths of complex world building layered with significant consequences for those who live within that world. I am more than ready to see where this story takes us and which characters will capture my heart over the playthrough. As with the previous games in the series, Xenoblade 3 embraces a mostly open world game feel. It seems the game is still sectioned off into areas and progression limited especially early on, but with how vast each area is and how much there is to do, this is certainly not an issue for any dedicated player. The areas are filled with enemies to attack or avoid, depending on the circumstances, landmarks to find, resources to collect, and people to help. When not exploring around the lands, you will likely be spending time in the colonies for restocking supplies and getting to know the people of the area. The affinity chart returns to show the people of the area, their relationships to each other, and can be adjusted as you complete side quests and activities. There are also rest spots and times to cook that can be helpful for getting to know the party better and giving some temporary boosts. In the trailers, we've also seen instances of vehicle travel that should add new dimensions to exploration beyond the usual skip travel between landmarks. Of course, time is progressing and will change the environment around us, including enemies and resources. All of this is likely familiar for those who have played previous Xenoblade games. The series has always embraced the exploration aspect of gameplay, and Xenoblade 3 seems to have everything from before, plus a little extra. Where the biggest changes to gameplay are, is in the combat. As you explore around, you'll encounter the usual beasts from previous games, but there is also the potential to encounter soldiers from Kieves and Agnes battling as well. 
It's a new aspect to the Xenoblade world, but I'm still not sure how it's going to function in practice. The actual combat itself, though, is a different matter and has some significant alterations from previous systems. The most immediate change is that, instead of battling with three party members at once, you now battle with all six. The expanded battle party means more to concentrate on during battle and more abilities and combinations of attacks you have at your disposal. There are still familiar aspects of combat though, such as the importance your positioning has when using certain arts. Each character has their arts with status effects like topple, returning, along with other arts that are more support based with healing and buffs. These are built into their battle roles, with attackers doing the majority of the damage, defenders drawing attention and blocking attacks, and healers doing what they do best. The proper use of arts can lead to strong combos and eventually to the chain attacks that allow you to do massive amounts of damage in a matter of seconds. Apart from the number of characters battling, this fits with the system seen throughout the series thus far, but there are a couple more changes for in-battle and even more for out-of-battle progression. While your main battle party will always consist of the six party members you start out with, there is a chance to add in a seventh battler in certain circumstances. These additional party members are called heroes and come from various backgrounds and with various skills. Once they've been unlocked, you can switch them out whenever you like, and while we still know very little about their exact characterization, I've already found some I'd like to get to know better, such as Bass Voice Napon. They each have their own classes, which is important in another area that I will get into later. The last big battle addition is literally big, the Ouroboros. By interlinking with compatible characters, you can combine to form a powerful form to use in battle for a period of time. The main party can form three different Ouroboros, with Noah and Mio, Lanz and Senna, and Yuni and Tyon as the pairings. Depending on which character takes primary control, the powers and design of the Ouroboros changes. Off the battlefield, the progression of your characters has also changed in several ways with the emphasis on the class system. Each character has a class, and each class has their set of arts, ranging from common to master arts. You can also sometimes combine arts into fusion arts that I'm sure are helpful as well. As you progress in a class, you unlock more arts, but you can also switch your class among the classes of your other party members and the heroes you have recruited along the way. By building out your class experience, you can improve your party's versatility for all sorts of situations. There has not been a Xenoblade game that has given you this degree of control over character progression, and that means that we have a lot of opportunity to go deep into this system. Plus, you can dress them up to look like each other through the outfit changes when you do class changes, which is fun for both gameplay and for fashion statements. On the topic of fashion, the presentation continues the Xenoblade series staples of fantastic art. The environments are absolutely gorgeous, to the point that I have seen many wondering how this could possibly run on the Switch. I'm sure they'll pull it off well, Monolith Soft knows what they're doing. The colors are used so well, and the details in the environment make everything feel full of life. The character designs and models also have a lot of standout features with clear thought going into how each of their outfits can enhance their personality and appeal. The animation also looks quite smooth, it captures so many little motions and emotive responses beautifully, even just in what we've seen so far. Musically, I've already professed my love for the first Xenoblade Chronicles soundtrack, and I think there is real potential for this one to be just as good. The use of the flute in so many of the tracks adds a wistful air to them that fits with the overall story and also lends the Xenoblade 3 soundtrack a signature voice among the music of the series. Speaking of voice, I'm looking forward to hearing a clean version of the song from one of the trailers with an actual vocalist. That song sounded beautiful even amidst the other game dialogue happening. Everything I have heard so far is excellent to listen to, and I can't wait to hear even more once I have my hands on the game. Now, Xenoblade in the past has had some issues with its UI and UX, and while things have improved with Xenoblade Definitive Edition and Torn of the Golden Country, I think Xenoblade 3 might have undone some of that progress. The screen is very busy with all of the arts, character profiles, bars for progress towards chain strikes and interlinking. Each one has important information, but I think there may be too much of it. Playing this game in handheld mode is likely to be a nightmare, and it's not a particularly accessible looking battle system. I'm not sure what the solution is, but I'll admit that it is my only worry about the presentation going into the game. 
Lastly, the voice acting, at least from what I've heard so far, seems like a massive improvement over Xenoblade 2. The vocal emotions seem to match the visuals and seem consistent for each character. I'm glad they learned from their mistakes on that front at least, but I wasn't too worried overall. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 has the potential to be an incredible game. The story has a great premise with a lot of room for character growth and a roller coaster of a ride. The combat system is revamped and you have incredible control over how you build your party. The presentation remains a highlight with gorgeous landscapes and fun character designs. The few nitpicks I have don't come anywhere close to overshadowing what looks like a game that will send us on an awesome journey. I can't see any Xenoblade fan not being excited for this game, and I hope it also captures the attention of newcomers who want to give the game and or series a try. Thank you for watching. Are you hyped for Xenoblade Chronicles 3 coming soon? Let me know in the comments, and while you're heading down there, liking the video is the best way to help others find and enjoy the video too. Subscribe for more videos on games new and old, and I hope to see you all in the next video. Have a great day, and happy gaming!